Ladies and gentlemen, students and teachers, I don't see many teachers here, but still, uh, there are some. Um, I'm glad to uh, be the first from our foreign department to introduce, to read a lecture in English, the public lecture in English, which is open to anybody. And I hope next time we'll see more people from other departments and I hope that this practice will continue. And my lecture is in American Studies, first of all because it's my, um, it's my major, it's my second major because my first major is uh, teaching English as a foreign language, and my second language is Cultural Studies, namely American Studies, and mostly Native American Studies. By Native American Studies, we mean what? We mean so-called Indians, First Nations, whatever you call them. There are many, many terms, but I prefer the term Native American. So people who lived in the United States of America, in, Northern, in the continent of Northern America and South America, originally, before Europeans came, right? This is the explanation of this term. And my lecture in American Studies would, will be devoted to the history and culture of Oklahoma. Why Oklahoma? Because this is the state I resided during my Fulbright scholarship, uh, which I took uh, last year. It ended this year. And I'm really happy, first of all, to share my experience in the United States. And also, I'm glad to kind of advertise and uh, promote the Fulbright program uh, to which I'm very grateful because it gave me this unique experience and if you're interested in the programs of this um, in the Fulbright program you can come up here after the lecture and take some handouts and brochures which will give you some information about them if you want to participate or if you have any questions if you're interested. Um, all right, so let's start the lecture itself. Um, the next slide, please. So the content of the lecture goes like this. We'll start with so-called diagnostic questions. What is diagnostic questions? So students who study the methods of teaching know that before you read, before you give the text for reading or for listening, you're supposed to give some questions so that students could answer them after they read or listen to the text, right? And it means if they answer the questions, so it means that they understood the text, they got something from it, right? And I decided to start my lecture with this kind of diagnostic questions that you will see later. Uh, then we'll talk about some general information about Oklahoma, its symbols, and other information. Um, then about OSU, which is the abbreviation of Oklahoma State University, where I resided and worked and did my research. And uh, of course, we cannot uh, omit the information about Native Americans, because um, Oklahoma, I think, is the most Indian state. And I will explain later why. That's why. We attach, I attach special importance to this part. So Native America, Oklahoma as Native America. And if we have time, hopefully, you will be able to see some pictures of mine accompanied with my I don't know, explanation, commentaries. Um, and then you are welcome with your questions. The next slide. The diagnostic questions go like this. You can put them down so as to follow the lecture and probably write down the answers if you understand, if you get them during the lecture. I hope you, you will. So the first question is, what is Go Pokes? And who are the Pokes? How do they call students at Oklahoma State University? What is General Allotment Act? General Allotment Act is concerned with the history of native Oklahoma 
in the history of Native Americans in the United States. And how many names of Native American tribes can you remember at the end of the lecture? We know there are many, 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 many tribes. I hope that you will remem remember at least some of them after the lecture. Excellent. So here you see the map of the United States of America. And uh, Oklahoma State is right in the middle, almost in the middle. Uh, in front of on the Kansas and on the top of Texas, right? So it's a southern state. It's a southern state. Well, so much for the geographical position. You can see it on the map. Next one. So now I'd like to tell you a little bit about the history of Oklahoma as a state. So. It was purchased, it was a part of Louisiana Purchase. LA stands for Louisiana, uh, which was a very big purchase for the United States, and it enlarged the territory of the United States considerably. So, and it was done in 1803. And Oklahoma State was a part of this big chunk of uh, land. Um, then, the name itself, Oklahoma, comes from Native American words, from Choctaw tribe people. Okla means people, and Hama means red. So basically, Oklahoma means red people. Um, the state acquired its statehood in 1907. In 1907. So you can trace the history of the United States back. We know that the Constitution was adopted in what, when? Any ideas? In the 18th century, right? In, this, in 1774 or 76, as far as I remember. And uh, Oklahoma became a state only at the beginning of the 20th century. So it was the 46th state uh, of the United States. Uh, and as we know, there are how many states? Fifty, right? Fifty. Plus the District of Columbia, right? Uh, so it was one of the last states that joined uh, the Union. Um, then, one more fact is that five, so-called five civilized, civilized tribes attempted statehood in 1905 just before so-called official statehood from uh, American government. Uh, it was done by the Native American tribes. And uh, this state was attempted under the name of Sequoia, but unfortunately, American government didn't allow this, and uh, this, this attempt failed. By five civilized tribes, we mean the next slide. Okay, so by five civilized tribes, we mean five Native American tribes who were most educated, who had their language, who had very developed culture, and we'll talk about it uh, later again. Um, but now I would like to draw your attention to the state song of Oklahoma. If you read, uh, probably it will be hard to read and understand what it means, right? Fur the cattle, spinacher, tomatoes, what's that? Tomatoes, right? Fur, it's supposed to be F-O-R, right? For the cattle, spinach and tomatoes. So this kind of writing illustrates the uh, phonetic, um, the pronunciation in Oklahoma State. Um, and if we, look, uh, if we look at the words of the song, they illustrate very clearly the picture of Oklahoma. For example, pasture for the cattle. And you can see the picture where uh, American buffaloes graze uh, in the fields of Oklahoma. So that's, uh, it is one of the best states 
for cattle breeding and for buffalo breeding and for other cattle. Uh, spinach and tomatoes, it's also an agricultural state. At least it was attempted to become an agricultural state, but um, somehow this attempt also failed because the, um, the soil was not very um, productive. Then, where the June bugs zoom, of course, where I can see big green pastures, there are a lot of uh, flowers, there are a lot of air, there are a lot of room. Here, room means not room in the sense of uh, a part of the building, right? But what? It means some space. Yeah. It means a lot of space. And if you look at these pictures, you see that there are no mountains. It's very, very flat. And this region of, of the United States is usually called Great Plains. Um, and it's famous for its cowboys. You can see here, plenty of room to swing a rope. That is, a lot of opportunities for cowboys to do their rodeos and other tricks. Plenty of heart and plenty of hope. Again, uh, this, this line um, probably alludes to the uh, to kind-hearted people and to the hope of American people, of European-American people, to get a lot from this state. And also, Oklahoma is famous for its tornadoes. And here you can see one of the pictures of such tornadoes. Well, fortunately or unfortunately, I didn't have the opportunity to see this kind of tornado. I saw a little bit of a tornado. So it, uh, this is actually the state song. Um, and in the state song, this peculiarity of Oklahoma is also illustrated, as you see, where the wind comes sweeping down the plain, and the waving wind can sure smell sweet when the wind comes right behind the rain. So usually uh, tornadoes uh, accompanied with a very heavy rain. Next one. Um, some more Oklahoma symbols and uh, some cultural things that uh, should be known is uh, the nickname of the state. So you probably know that each state has a nickname and this state is called the Sooner State. Why the Sooner State? Because um, when the land of Oklahoma was opened for uh, European settlers, uh, um, there was a certain date and a certain time of the day uh, when these European settlers were supposed to rush into the land and get uh, as much land as they could. And uh, people who broke the law, people who actually uh, grabbed this land before this date and before this time and crossed the border sooner than allowed, they were called Sooners. And even now, uh, there are, uh, as far as I remember, basketball and football, t football teams uh, who call themselves Sooners. And in general, uh, Oklahomans call themselves Sooners. Then, the state flag, which is an important symbol for any state, uh, is, actually you can see it here. This is the design of this um, PowerPoint presentation. It's uh, a field of blue with a shield crossed by a peace pipe and an olive branch. So you, you can see here the, uh, the shield, uh, a peace pipe, which is a symbol of peace for Native Americans, and an olive branch, which is a symbol of peace for Europeans, as we know, right? So this combination of two peaceful symbols in the, um, in the state flag, I think is very is very meaningful and um, gives a lot of hope. Um, so here you can see the picture of an Osage Indian who, were, uh, who originally lived in Oklahoma. And one of the um, anthropologists say that they were 
gigantic. They were robust and tall, as if they were gigantic. And when I showed this PowerPoint presentation to uh, some of my colleagues, they noted that uh, the color of the skin is not totally red, as you see. Right? And you will see some more pictures of Native Americans later. Um, okay, some more symbols which are also connected with Native Americans are American bison or American buffalo, which is a state animal and which is a very important uh, spiritual thing for Native Americans. State grass is called Indian grass and state wildflower is called Indian blanket. So you see that uh, the culture of Native Americans permits uh, all the symbols of Oklahoma. And I would like also to uh, introduce some fun facts about Oklahoma, which I think are important to know, uh, or probably just interesting to know, curious. Um, one of them is that Oklahoma doesn't have any man-made, man-made, sorry, Oklahoma has only man-made lakes. 200 man-made lakes. There are no natural lakes. It's a very desert state. It's a very dry state. So, and I think that this fact tells much about American people who try to improve the environment and who try to make the environment better for the people and for the for the environment itself. So here you can see uh, the Boomer Lake, which is in still water. Um, so this picture was taken in January. So January is considered to be cold sometimes. So the climate changes very quickly. It can be very warm, like 15 or 16 or even 19. Uh, degrees Celsius plus in January, but it can be also about minus, uh, I don't know, maybe 10 at most. The next one, please. One more fun fact is that um, Oklahoma State Capitol, here there is no mistake in the word capital, because here we mean not the capital as the city, right? Uh, like the central city of the um, of the country, but we mean what? Every city in the United States has a capital, a governmental building, right? And you all know about the great uh, the capital of the of Washington D.C., right? What we call Capitoli, right? So in here, I mean. Not the capital as the city, but the building within the city, Oklahoma State Capitol. It's the only one in the world with an oil well drilled beneath it. So what does it mean? It means that there is a lot of oil in Oklahoma. There is a lot of oil and gas. And uh, it was one of the reasons why European settlers rushed into the land. And in the picture you can see so-called Golden Driller, which is the largest freestanding statue in the world, and which is in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. <coughs> One more fun fact is that the first parking meter also was invented in uh, Oklahoma. What is the parking meter? We still don't have them. The parking meter is a machine where you can pay uh, for parking your car. So imagine how, how much money they gather because everybody needs to park his or her car, right? I think this is a very witty invention for Americans. Next one. One more interesting fact is that there are 39 tribes and nations of American Indians with headquarters in Oklahoma. 
and descendants of original 67 tribes inhabiting Indian territory still live there. By Indian territory, we mean the state of Oklahoma. When we start talking about the history, we'll clarify this uh, term. So here you can see, um, in the picture, you can see um, a man doing a powwow ritual. So a powwow is a, um, is a holiday, is a very colorful festival organized by Native Americans. And uh, of course, it means a lot spiritually for them. But nowadays, I think it's more of a decorative function. It's more of an entertaining function. And also, you can see here uh, stamps and uh, emblems uh, of different Native American tribes. I couldn't put all the uh, symbols of 39 or 67 tribes. That's just impossible. Okay, the next one. The capital of Oklahoma State is Oklahoma City. And actually, you can see the capital here, Oklahoma State Capital, uh, beneath which there is an oil drill. Um, and there are some more pictures of this um, city, which is um, around, which has around the same number of people living there, like Lano Day. It's about 600,000 people. And it's the biggest, um, it's the biggest city in uh, the state of Oklahoma. Next one. Tulsa is the second largest city in Oklahoma. And uh, at some point at the beginning of the 20th century, it was called oil capital of the world. And it has become a birthplace of US Route 66. Has anybody heard of this Route 66? Never? It's a famous route or road which goes from, um, if you imagine the, uh, the map of the United States of America, which goes from Michigan State, which is in the, in the northeast, right? Uh, in the upper part of the United States. And it goes to the very middle of the United States and to the west to California. So the, this route goes through the whole country. And, well, if you want to see the United States of America, you can you know, rent a car and go uh, along this route, and you will see everything. OK, the next um, site, so to say, is Stillwater, which is a little town. Uh, which is a little university town where I actually resided. And uh, if you look at the sign of this uh, town, it says where Oklahoma began. And if you look at the map and the position of this town, you can see that it's, it's, in this, it's the same distance from Stillwater to Tulsa and from Stillwater to Oklahoma. And uh, why it says where Oklahoma began, uh, it's because exactly at this region of the state, um, those who were called Sooners, European settlers, they rushed exactly into this region. And this is where the state of Oklahoma virtually began. Um, so Stillwater, mostly famous for its university, which is um, well, the representatives of this university say that that's the best university in the state, though there are many other universities, like Tulsa University, uh, University of Tulsa and others, but it's, uh, it's supposed that Oklahoma State University is the biggest and is the best. And here you can see some pictures of this um, university. Um, so first of all, I would like to draw your attention to probably to OSU Library, which is a very big building, and it's very convenient to work there. Uh, everything is automat automatized, and uh, you, can, you can print everything you need. 
You can scan everything you need. You can use the computer, etc. You can use the laptop. You can actually rent the laptop for, I think, three days, take it home, use it for three days, then return it back. Or you can take a laptop and work on it in the library. I think uh, there are all the conditions in OSU library for research and uh, uh, study. And then the building called Student Union uh, probably also can sound uh, non-familiar to you. So by Student Union, um, they mean a building where students um, where students get together, where they have their own offices, like the graduate student office, where students can get together and discuss the events they're going to take part in, uh, where they can actually um, perform these events, where they can have balls, they can have, where they can eat. There are cafes and cafeterias there, so, um, so there is everything for the student. Um, then, one more thing, which is very important for American university culture, is of course sports, and namely American football. In one of the pictures here, you can see uh, an American football team, all dressed in the colors of the university, which probably you understood was orange. And they, uh, the team itself is called OSU Cowboys, and therefore, uh, all the students at the university call themselves cowboys. Uh, and all the girls call themselves cowgirls. Um, and one of the mottos, one of the, what we call richovki, is go pokes. So pokes here means cowboys. So when they say go pokes, it means go cowboys. Uh, and with this kind of sentence, with this kind of exclamation, they try to encourage their football team to win. Um, one more figure that you see here in the lower right corner is Pistol Pete. Um, he's a typical, he's probably a typical uh, picture of a cowboy, right? He has a big hat, uh, cowboy boots, cowboy jeans, and pistols. So, and Pistol Pete was the nickname of a real man who was very skillful at um, shooting and was a very colorful picture of a cowboy. And uh, the story about him goes that he, um, uh, his father was killed by some villains and he was, um, he was trying to revenge upon this. And actually he took revenge over the murderers of his father. So this is what he's famous for. I know, well, at least for me, this kind of symbol is strange for the university. Well, for example, the symbol of our university is Darji Banzara, right? Yeah. Whose uh, statue is right uh, near this building, right? So, uh, who was a scientist, who was a great man of letters, but not the man like this. But still, um, I think this is a part of uh, American culture and um, we should accept it. And one more picture which I included here uh, says, water runs orange at OSU. So this is just a funny picture, um, meaning that Americans love to be funny and to have fun, to laugh at each other. Um, and so for... Uh, this fountain is before the OSU library and um, every Halloween they put some orange paint in the fountain just for fun. Because orange, first, is the color of the university and second, it's the color of the Halloween as we know, right? Okay, one more thing which is also a part of univers American university culture is homecoming. So each university, every year, has a homecoming event. Homecoming 
as you can probably guess from the word itself, is what we call встречи выпускников. So all the alumni of the university come back to the university for, first of all, for the football game and for, uh, for looking at some decorations like this. So here you can see a huge house decoration. So it's about maybe three meters in height and about maybe five, even more in length. And uh, it's a great job because it's, it's a kind of a collage uh, and it's made of colored tissue paper. So uh, students, take a lot of time to do this kind of job and uh, they have a lot of these kind of decorations and when homecoming comes all the people hang out in the streets uh, have a walk along the streets and look at those decorations admire them take pictures and uh, have fun so next slide please and here you can see actually the the links to some more pictures, but we won't uh, we won't waste our time and go there. So you, you saw only one. So if you're interested, you can go to the OSU site and see some more probably. Mm -hmm. Next one. Um, now I'd like to tell a few words about the history of Oklahoma as a Native American state. Um, all the history of Oklahoma is permitted with Native American history. And the first event which is connected with, uh, the first important event in the history of Oklahoma here is so-called Indian Removal Act. So by Indian Removal Act, we mean the law that removes Indians from prosperous, from agriculturally productive, from sunny, uh, rich in cotton states to desert of Oklahoma. So Oklahoma is not good for agriculture. Oklahoma is not good in, um, in nature, so to say. There, is no, there are no many natural sites like, for example, we have here, like mountains, for example. Oklahoma doesn't have this. And uh, so the American government, under the, under the guidance of Andrew Jackson, who was the president at that time, decided to, um, to remove Indians from southern states like Florida, Georgia, uh, Louisiana, and others, to so-called Indian territory. So. The state didn't have any name at that time. It was just Indian territory, and it was reserved exactly for Indians. And uh, they, they decided to talk about this with Indians, of course, and only two tribes agreed to sign this agreement and move, uh, and agreed to move without any war. Here you can see, um, so the, the arrows, uh, the red and uh, black arrows show the trail of tears, the way Native Americans took from the states of uh, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, to Indian Territory, which later became Oklahoma. So for uh, American government, it was just Indian Removal Act. It was just the act of parliament. But for Indians who see everything very metaphorically, and um, it was a different thing for them, they called it a trail of tears. Because, the next slide please. Because many people, 4,000 people died during this trail of tears. So remember we talked about five civilized tribes. So during uh, this Indian Removal Act, those five civilized tribes which I mentioned here, 
were forced to go to the Indian territory and leave their land. So these are the tribes, Chopto, which who moved in 1830 Cherokee, which you probably heard of Greek, Chickasaw and Seminole, who actually refused to do it, and they were involved in all kinds of, war, of wars. Um, so they were considered five civilized tribes, and they were supposed to move, and not everybody, of course, wanted to move from their own land, from fertile and prosperous land to unknown and uh, uh, infertile Oklahoma. But uh, European Americans were trying to get rid of the Indians, and there was a lot of cheating, there, was, there were a lot of killing, there was a lot of um, dishonest actions toward Native Americans, and finally, um, some of them decided to move, some of them were forced to move, um, and actually it took 28 years for them to move to the Indian Territory. So, and as a result, there were 46,000 Indians that were removed. The next one. Here you can see the map showing the Indian Territory, 1820-1854. So, uh, you can see the names of the tribes. Shown here, there were Cherokee lands, Creek and Seminole, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Cherokee. And there was a public land strip which didn't belong to anybody, which didn't belong to the American government, which didn't belong to Native Americans either. Next one. Um, then the next slide shows, shows how um, Native American tribes were trying to establish self-governments. So in each tribe there was a self-government. For example, in 1855, self-government of Choctaw and Chickasaw nations were established, was established. And in 1856, the government of Creek and Seminole nations. But here, again, you can see uh, in the gray, you can see leased district by Choctaw, Chickasaw to the US. You see that even at this point, uh, European settlers begin to buy, begin to lease the land from uh, Indian nations. Next one. Oh, this slide shows, um, shows the part of Oklahoma, which is in uh, blue, right in the middle, which was open finally to, to European settlers. So it was open in 1889. And this is where European settlers rushed. And this uh, period of history is known as a land rush or land run. Um, one more act which I, was, uh, I talked uh, earlier was the General Allotment Act. So, as far as European settlers still wanted the land in Oklahoma, the uh, American government decided to defend Native Americans on the one hand. On the other hand, they tried, so to say, to tame them, to tame Priruchit, right? And as you see here, um, Senator Henry Dawes was the initiator of this act, and he said, so the aim of this act was for the Indian to drop his Indianness and be assimilated into the population and his property rights be protected. So on the one hand, they wanted the property rights be protected, which is a sacred thing for Americans. On the other hand, they wanted Indians to drop their Indianness, to forget their culture, to assimilate into the white population. Um, so, the Allotment Act, Act actually meant giving land, giving a piece of land to each Indian. 
Um, but, of course, they gave sometimes desert land or near desert lands unsuitable for farming. So it was not very productive. And so here you can see uh, the, uh, the photograph which shows actually the land run when the European settlers or Sooners rushed into the land of Oklahoma to get the, uh, to get the land for themselves. So why, if it was desert, if it was infertile, if it was inappropriate for farming, why did they want it then? Next slide. They want it because of the oil. When the Indians were given these pieces of land, um, some oil was discovered in these pieces of land. And now European settlers also wanted this land. So and here you can see some oil industry facts, like oil seeps or medicine springs, which were used in uh, Oklahoma by Native Americans for medical purposes. And then there were some other oil uh, mines recovered. There were some other oil fields discovered. And Oklahoma became in 1907, it became the largest oil producer, and Tulsa became the oil capital of the world. And of course, the Union, the American government, wanted this territory now, and they decided to, uh, to include it into the territory of the United States. And that's why um, the date of 1907 uh, is considered to be the statehood date. So in this map, you can see how many lands were, um, were open to white settlers. You see that the Indian tribes were moved to one of the corners of the state, as you see. So we can see the expansion of the American territory here. On this slide you can see some, again, some symbols of the United States, uh, which is a coin. And um, in the United States, as I think in, as in every country, on the coins you can see the pictures of the cities, the pictures of people, the pictures of some important buildings sometimes. So this slide shows different coins on which you can see the symbols of Oklahoma. For example, the first one, uh, they're all, I think two upper ones are quarters, which is 20, a coin of 25 cents, which shows the uh, symbol, uh, the state bird, the state bird of Oklahoma, which is a sparrow, a kind of sparrow. And also you can see a Chickasaw resort. Also you can see an American dollar in the lower row, which shows uh, famous Native American women. For Native American culture today, um, from what I learned, from what I could see uh, during my stay in the United States, they said there is a Native American blood is in everybody here. So, and I think not only in Oklahoma, but in the whole United States. So we know that the uh, United States of America is sometimes called a melting pot, a salad bowl, a multicultural state. There are a lot of nations and nationalities in this country. And of course, uh, Native Americans couldn't stay as they are, especially uh, if we bear in mind that now it's only 1% of Native Americans in the United States. 
while in Oklahoma State, it's 3%. So it's considered to be a lot of Native Americans in Oklahoma. And of course, they couldn't but mix with uh, the white population, with the white and Asian and other population. So here you can see um, an example of Native American modern art. Um, this is the work of Tony Mafia, who is a Cherokee artist. And uh, he, in this picture, he explores the theme of Trail of Tears. So if you look at it closely, you can see the great chief and the people who are suffering here and the people who are praying. So he tried to include all the aspects of Native American life. And I think um, because of the central image of this great Native American chief, um, he is trying to say that Native American culture is still there and it is a very important part of American culture in general. Again, one of the modern ways to remember the Trail of Tears is a motorcycle race. So they do the Trail of Tears motorcycle ride or motorcycle race annually. And as far as we live in the modern world, I think we should use the modern ways to remember our culture. For example, like this. Um, when I resided in Oklahoma State University, I went to different uh, lectures and classes of American scholars and American teachers who taught Native American literature and American culture and American studies. And uh, one of the classes I went to was Native American literature. And uh, I'm not going to talk to every author here I just want you to look at these authors and just to um, get to know some of them. If you come across with this or that name, uh, I hope you will remember that this is a Native American author. And uh, actually they go chronologically. Uh, for example, Zitka Lesha um, is considered to be um, the classics of Native American literature, as well as John Joseph Matthews and Scott Mamaday whom I saw in, in Rio. Um, as for Louis Udrich and Susan Power, and especially Sherman Alexei, uh, they're considered to be the modern poets and writers. And um, I would like to draw your attention especially to Sherman Alexei, who, whose, um, whose videos you can find actually on YouTube, and if you're interested, you can watch them. And uh, his, his work, Ten Little Indians, abounds in puns, humor, and uh, very interesting characters uh, and figures of speech. I really liked his, his stories and his poems. Excellent. Um, one, more, one more cultural thing which is uh, very typical for the United States, I think, is a musical. Um, and the musical, which is connected with Native American culture, was called Oklahoma. And it was released in 1955, and it was very, very popular. Um, though the story was very um, typical, I'd say. It was a love story of a cowboy and the daughter of a farm girl, and two cowboys were fighting for her heart. Um, and this musical was very popular, and as you can see, it was a box office smash, and it ran for 2,243 uh, performances. And it won an Academy Award in 1955 film adaptation. And actually, the state song of Oklahoma comes from this musical. So apart from 
literature and uh, theater, musicals, we're all involved, especially nowadays in the age of globalization, we're all involved, next slide, we're all involved in the global net, right, in the internet. And of course, Native Americans are also there, and uh, they are trying to promote their culture, they're trying to um, share their culture and share their thoughts about who they are, about how they feel. And here you can see one of the poems actually read. Here you can see only the words, but if you go to this link, you can uh, actually see how they recite it. Because recite, reciting is a very, again, typical art of Native Americans. Reciting, singing, telling stories orally is a very typical thing for Native Americans, and they do it on YouTube. Um, so, if you look at the words of this poem, what can you say? They used to say, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. Do you remember this from the cowboy movies? Yes, we all remember this. Do you think it's very pleasant for Indians to hear this? Not at all. So, the answer to this saying, by the way of such poems like this. I must be a no good at being Indian because I feel alive and kicking. Forgive me. You have robbed of your tongues the taproot of thought. So Indians were deprived of their tongues. They were made to forget their languages and they were made to uh, learn English. So now they express themselves in English, but still they express the thoughts and the way of thinking, which is very different from average American. Next. Here's the continuation of the uh, poem. There is no history book with my story. There is no newspaper to give me my glory because no one has heard this language in years. So I think they feel sorry about their own culture and about their own language and about the fact that they were forgotten by um, European Americans who considered themselves to be the only Americans. But Native Americans were already there. As they say, nobody discovered us. We were there always, before all European settlers came. Um, so this poem is read by uh, the comedian group, which is called 1491s. Um, yeah, you can see the logo here. 1491s. Why do you think they call themselves like this? What happened in 1492? There is a rhyme. 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Columbus discovered America, right? So, 1491s. So, those Americans who were there before Columbus, they call themselves like this. And this is an indigenous comedy group, and I especially like the uh, video which is called I am an Indian too. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot look at it here, but again, if you're interested, you can just type on YouTube, I'm an Indian too, and it will come up, and you can watch it. This is what modern Indians do now. This is how they share their own culture. This is how they laugh at themselves, and how they laugh at American interpretations of their culture. So again, if you're interested, you can uh, watch these videos. Some of them really silly, some of them are meaningful. Uh, still, um, I think they're meaningful because they talk about themselves and they talk about who they are. So, do we still have time to do this part? Okay, good. Um, so, 
If you would like to look at some pictures of mine while well, I was uh, there, so you're welcome. Um, so the pistol pit figures are everywhere in Oklahoma State University. And here you can see me with this symbol of Oklahoma State University. So this is the orientation before, uh, before I went to Oklahoma. Um, the group of Russian Fulbrighters gathered in New York for the orientation session. This, is, this was one of the entertainments that they provided us with. You cannot, you cannot visit the United States without going to, to an American musical, I think. Next. So this is my workplace. Next. Um, the State Fair. So the State Fair also a very typical event in American culture where um, I think especially for Oklahoma, because there they show all agricultural um, achievements, uh, all cattle breeding achievements, so you could see a lot of cattle there, buffaloes, uh, oxen, etc., etc., a lot of animals. And of course you can buy a lot of special Oklahoma food Next. Um, one more part of you know, American university culture is sharing your culture, because it's a mix of cultures. And again, I couldn't go there and uh, not share my own culture. And as you see here in this picture, I'm standing near a Mexican and an Indonesian. So if you go to the United States, it's um, sometimes you you communicate more, more than ever with many, many different people of the world. And you not only share your culture and show your culture, but you also learn about different cultures. So here you can see me in African uh, traditional clothes. This is Tulsa that I was talking about. And New York. Next. Times Square, you all heard of it. And uh, again, um, in every city, uh, in every capital of the world, there is such a square that you cannot but visit, like Red Square in Moscow or Times Square in New York. Next. Next. Oh, I don't comment upon this one. Next. Gingerbread houses. It's also a very interesting tradition of cooking a gingerbread house. You probably did it here. Some people do it here too. Uh, so around Christmas time, they usually uh, bake gingerbread houses, and uh, uh, this one was an exhibition of them. And there were many, many, many different, very beautiful gingerbread houses that you could buy and take it home. And also around uh, the Christmas time, you can see the exhibition of Christmas trees made of many different materials, like paper, plastic bottles, uh, what else, tissue paper, uh, so all material imaginable. And also, uh, you can also buy those Christmas trees. So each Fulbrighter is assigned uh, a supervisor. And again, my supervisor was not a so-called true American, originally who was from India. Um, in this picture, I was trying to show how flat this state was, how flat the land is, which was um, very unusual for me, 
who grew here in Buratia. I was born in Buratia and spent all my life here. So for me, it was very unusual and uh, sometimes boring. I also took part in uh, teaching English as a second language conference in Oklahoma City, which was also a good experience. Next. Which was also multicultural. So everything is multicultural. Next one. Next. Yeah, and I would like to draw your attention to this picture too, because this is the Native American um, poet and writer I was talking about, uh, Miss Scott Mamaday. So we went to the meeting with him where he read his poetry and where he signed books. So, and it was very interesting to listen to him. This is one of the sites on campus. So one more thing about American university culture is that is a campus which includes not only buildings where students have their classes, uh, where they study and go to the library, but also they live on campus. So, and I think it's very convenient. You can walk from your home to, to a class. Um, Guthrie uh, was the first capital of Oklahoma. So we saw that, um, I told you that Oklahoma City is the capital of, of, of Oklahoma. But actually Guthrie, a little nice town, was the first capital of Oklahoma. And when there was a lot of oil discovered in Oklahoma City, so finally they decided 